thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, and we're very excited that today we're co-hosting our webinar with a partner of our Second Watch. Uh, so my name is Diane Gary. I'm Product Marketing Manager here at AlertLogic. I have the uh, honor of being the moderator for today's event. With me here in Houston is Kevin Stevens, a security researcher with AlertLogic. Good morning, Kevin. Good morning. Great. Let's get started. Uh, as everyone knows, uh, Target was one of the largest uh, breaches in history. And uh, we're going to go over some of the timeline of how things uh, originated and initiated an attack. Um, breaking uh, 1st of December, actually the 18th, the Wall Street Journal and uh, actually Krebs at the same time started coming out uh, with reports that Target had uh, been compromised. And of course, after that, uh, uh, coming into January uh, 10th or so, we uh, come up with Target actually confirms that they uh, were part of a breach. And uh, eventually, they send out uh, a form, or they post it on the website, that uh, they were compromised. Uh, a bunch of numbers came out. Uh, they started at 110 million, 70 million, 40 million. Uh, we heard uh, numbers all over the place. And this is the form they sent out, something you really never want to see as a company. It's going to hurt your reputation. It's uh, going to hurt you financially. But uh, this is it. The Dear Target Guest, and they go on to say that you've been part of a, uh, of a breach. Uh, the, <clears throat> the attack with a malicious software infects POS systems and sends credit card data uh, via FTP. Target actually runs a, a self-made POS system running Windows OS. <clears throat> the, the malware, which was uh, Black POS, was actually traced to uh, Russia and sold to uh, several European cyber criminals. It, uh, we found it in many different forums along the way. And it impacted uh, 110 customers. Uh, the 110 is actually not total credit cards. It turns out that approximately 40 million were credit cards. Uh, the rest of that number really comes down uh, to emails. So uh, that's one of the uh, one of their uh, documents they sent out was telling their customers, you know, not to return any type of email coming through them uh, or be suspicious of it because they have their email details. Uh, the data started being sold on the underground in small batches. So it was actually difficult for researchers at that time. Uh, to figure out where this data was coming from. Usually uh, they'll do a big dump and they'll sell them at once. They were selling a small amount at a time, so it made it really difficult for us. Um, eight other retailers were uh, compromised at the same time. Uh, all POS systems, and we'll, we'll get into a few of those uh, a little bit later. And they began actually arresting uh, some of the card users. And the malware uh, started going up for sale. We're going to get into the malware now. A little bit about the, the actual breach and what was lost. But the malware itself, this is where it gets interesting. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, it was actually being sold under another name called DumpCC back in February 12th, 2013. And uh, from that point on, it started uh, emerging into a more complex uh, malware. At that point, it was priced really high. The under underground community weren't really using it at that time because of the prices. Uh, but the uh, developer called Refor. Uh, actually started a good marketing plan. He had uh, three different versions of the software. He had the budget version, uh, which implemented sending uh, protocol FTP. It used FTP, but the logs weren't encrypted. It was the first edition. It was first edition was free actually, but uh, it ended up uh, being sold for eighteen hundred dollars. No support on this one, uh, so this was uh, this was actually easy to find on the forums for free too. The economy version actually started uh, doing encryption, which uh, actually prevented other hackers from stealing uh, the data that uh, the, the initial attacker was trying to get. And Sport was with that one too, and they listed that one for uh, 2000 Now the full version, $2,300, uh, this you get all the bells and whistles. Everything's encrypted. You get free updates for life, uh, and sometimes that makes a difference, especially with AV engines. And, um, and that's where it went from there. Okay, some of the more of the details of the uh, Black POS is it actually, uh, once we decrypted some of the, uh, or once we translated some of the pieces of the software, it actually has user agreements, uh, just like you'd see on typical software, use this program at your own risk, and creators assume no responsibility for use of this software, which is interesting. And he has all his seller information in case you want to purchase this from him. And you see he has, e he has several emails, ICQ, uh, he also has Skype if you want to contact him like that. And this, were, this is the stolen credit card dumps that were initially being seen in some of the underground forums, particularly on the Russian forums. <coughs> the initial dump uh, came out, and these were mainly classic cards, which are going to be low limit cards. That's why you see an average price of about $12. 
and uh, the, then they started coming out with some more uh, higher grade cards, uh, platinum cards. And you see the range on those are 50 to 60 because these have typically have higher limits. So they're going to be sold for more. But uh, after this, what happened was uh, the banking institutions started to cancel the cards. And the market started, being, started to get saturated with more credit card dumps. And the prices actually came down. It's not shown here. But they actually cratered uh, not too long after this. And this is, uh, this is going to be a basic run through of how uh, Katoksa works. Rescator is actually the person that weaponized and did a lot of the card dumps uh, for this piece of malware. But uh, initially, it uh, disables the firewall. It creates an auto run entry to launch at boot. And what this means is even if you cancel this or it gets uh, rebooted, and POS systems often do, it'll, uh, it'll start back at uh, launch again. And at that point, it infects the POS system. It creates two files, dumb.exe and mm.exe. Actually, it increased either or those files with two different, two different names. And from that point, uh, they scrape tracks one and two from the credit card data. And those tracks involve the uh, credit card numbers, the CVB, some, sometimes also the PIN number. Then it saves the data to a default, or actually, it's also it's a default, but it's also a fake .dll file. Then from that, from then it establishes a share to the centralized server. And then from the centralized server, it actually stores the data and eventually sends it off uh, via a text file, which is a clear text file, uh, which is easy to spot. But anyway, it sent it off to an external FTP server. And uh, this is uh, some of the research we did in our, we ran the malware in our sandbox and uh, monitored some of the processes and exactly what it did. This, is, well, this would be a normal view. This is the typical services running right now. Nothing's been infected on uh, this particular machine. And what it does now, now since we run the service, it actually creates a, uh, another service called Black uh, POS, or POS WDS, I mean. And uh, at that point, it starts to, uh, it starts to run, and it'll, it'll actually run as an administrator, as you see. And uh, it starts the process, you can see it down there, it's hard to read, the POS WDS. That creates a regular, typical looking user and this user actually has all privileges on the machine, which is extremely dangerous. And the step two, what happens is it, it actually creates a, dot, a net.exe file. And this is the file that's actually going to start doing some of the transferring to the shares it creates in its centralized server, getting ready to send it off uh, out of the system. OK, step two. <clears throat> this is where the back door is created. This is where it creates uh, what's called a blade logic uh, exe. And the reason I use Blade Logic because it actually uh, is part of some of the systems uh, that they use within their infrastructure. This is all just to obfuscate uh, what they're trying to do. So when the administrators look in the log, they see these things they're like, yeah, oh well, that's uh, that's actually looks like it's part of our infrastructure, so it's not uh, as suspicious as it would be, you know, if it was logged in you know, hacker.exe. But if you see on here, uh, going down to the bottom, it actually it'll kill the Blade Logic service and then it'll rerun the service again. The Blade Logic service actually is part of uh, it correlates all of the data coming out of the POS systems, and this is what gets ready to send it to the main server. And it does it at predetermined times of 10 a.m. and 5 p.m. And uh, BMC, that's where they got some of the uh, username. Uh, that's actually the best one user account that's on there. And uh, if you read down there according to BMC, they, they say this runs as a system, and it has rights, and you should be very cautious about it. But this is uh, one of the usernames they use. Uh, creating your share, so things would look at would look, would look at suspicious. Step two on this is the post infection activity. This is actually where the data is exfiltrated out of the network. And it's an FTP. It's all it is, simple FTP, nothing encrypted, and it's sending out a text file <clears throat> to a malicious server on the outside. And uh, you see the uh, those are actual the username digital L, digital W and crisis eight, eighteen. 1089, and it sends it out. It creates a file with the time and the timestamp on it, and uh, sends it out to the external server. And a lot of these external servers are actually um, web servers that have been taken over, and uh, they use them to try to hide the data within them. So it, you know they'll look suspicious there as well. And here are some of the theories of how, why, or how they, uh, the company was actually infiltrated. The Ariba, the Ariba vendor portal. Um, We've looked at that. That actually is one of the portals that they come in. They do, they'll look at POS. They do a lot of different type of um, activity and tasks within the uh, target portal. 
This is actually a, a third party vendor. Uh, but this is one of the theories. There's actually several theories of how they were actually to they did the initial uh, attack on the network. And this is also another theory. Oh, well, this is a ribbon network. Again, this is the login portal for them. Uh, but what happens is a lot of these vendor portals will give you access uh, to the, uh, the company portal, from this example, Target. And uh, Fazio, uh, they were also uh, blamed as part of it as well. Uh, we don't think that uh, it had as much to do with them as, as everyone says. And if you read down on the bottom, they actually said they're not actually part of the investigation. But they were uh, part of, uh, they were also a vendor within the company that uh, did uh, some billing type uh, tasks for Target. And uh, another vendor portal, this is actually a, a Target portal. This is a direct Target portal for vendor shipping. Uh, this may have been compromised as well. This is one of our theories. And uh, as you can see, this is part of the Target portal. And at the same time, it's interesting, if you look down the, uh, their retailer list, uh, you see Neiman Marcus uh, group on there. They were actually compromised uh, with a similar type POS malware at the, uh, during the same time as the Target uh, uh, attack went on. And this is how the malware, uh, <coughs> the malware was injected. It was installed, this is the theory anyway, uh, the POS server uh, actually delivers updates uh, the centralized POS server can actually deliver updates to the POS systems. So if the malware was actually, uh, in fact, the POS server was actually uh, infected by the malware, it sent out an update to the POS systems, and the POS systems started to run the actual uh, black POS malware. And from that point on, each POS sent it to a centralized server, and then they sent it, uh, they actually traded the data out to an external server. And here's the evolution of POS malware. It's actually been around for, around for quite a while. Uh, back in 2008, uh, memory dumper, uh, very uh, uh, basic uh, memory scraper. It actually copied a specific process in memory. And Dexter POS is probably the ones that uh, more people have heard of if you've been watching the POS malware. It steals the process list from an infected machine while parsing memory dumps. And uh, Dexter is actually where the black POS started to originate from. And uh, vSkimmer came out not too long after that. That also detects card readers, grabs information, sends data to the control server. All, the, all very similar tasks. All, they're, all, they're all pulling from memory. And that's one reason they're able to get uh, the card, the unencrypted card data. And then Alina POS system, that's actually been around since early 2000. It's all the way up to 5.2 on version numbers. Also does a similar, uh, similar task. And then of course we get down uh, to the target breach <clears throat> and black POS, Capitoxa, and that's uh, that's a very complex system, and we're actually going to be seeing more of this type of malware in complex forms. And we get to how to mitigate the risk. <clears throat> Some of this is going to be basic uh, security 101, but obviously your point of sale systems, you need to scan them with an antivirus. You need to make sure your updates, uh, your signature up are updated. Uh, you need to check for auto run keys, you know, particularly ones that uh, you don't recognize. Uh, this one was CBC HIT. And uh, like I said earlier, if you have it in auto run, it's not deleted, it's just going to start back up uh, when you reboot the machine. Uh, you can also check for uh, three execu executables that were involved with this particular one was SVCHST. They named it as similar to processes that you would normally see, so it doesn't stand out. And of course, done.exe and mm.exe. Uh, but also be aware these file names can change. So uh, just because you're monitoring these, you're going to have to have other, uh, other layers of defense. You should also, and this comes down to hardening servers anyway, but you need to disable external FTP uh, mm. outbound access from point of sale systems, uh, either at the host layer or uh, the edge device itself. You can also create white lists of acceptable external addresses. You can use IP filtering. And you can use ACL, so that way the machines are only speaking to hosts that they are already authorized to speak to. There are also products on the market to, res to, <coughs> to, excuse me, to, res to restrict uh, initializing and hijacking of running processes or spawning child processes. That way you know that the jobs running are the only, that are the only jobs that are allowed to run. Um, and security policy policies should include a list of approved executables uh, that's similar to above, but blacklisting would help prevent uh, bla bad execu executables such as blade logic from running. And there's also several DLP products that would do this, help in this competition. So thank you, and uh, I'll hand it back over.